Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'll ask you to reconvene if we can get Sean and his friends um, to, um, there we go. <laughs> That's how he refer referred to me. So my name is Michael Liebreich. I'm the chairman of the advisory board of Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Um, and this panel is on other markets. Um, and I think that, that's a great title because it leaves us open to speak about anything. But what we're here mainly to talk about is developments, mainly in renewable energy. We may touch on other topics, storage and so on. But outside the core markets, which as we all know have been largely around Europe, North America and selected Asian markets like China, which have been uh, developing for quite some time now. We have, I'm afraid, only 45 minutes, and there are, as you'll have noticed, <laughs> seven people up here, eight if you include me, and I like talking a lot, so we're going to try not to do that. What we're going to do is we're going to waive introductions almost completely. The people you've got up here, you can read their names if you've got good eyesight. If not, ask the person sitting next to you. Um, but. In summary, Kerry Adler, President, Chief Executive Officer of Sky Power Global Canada. And if you wave as I read you out. Edgar Kevek, Managing Director, Asia Green Capital Partners in Singapore. Sami Karebi, Chief Executive Officer of Environmina Power Systems. Henning Wuster, Director of Knowledge, Policy and Finance, International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA. Henning, did you wave? I didn't catch you. There we go. Henning. Paddy Padmanathan, President and Chief Executive Officer of Aqua Power, Saudi Arabia. Nancy Fund, from, uh, the Founder and Managing Director of DBL Investors, Double Bottom Line Investors, United States. And last but not least, the famous heavyweight Anoop Jacob, the local champion of uh, the Director of Mazda Capital UAE. So that's who you've got up here. And what we're going to do I'm going to try and divide it, broadly speaking, into um, three or four short sections. First of all, we'll talk about markets, which markets are hot, which are not, which are dead. We'll talk about the impact of oil and gas prices. I think it would be unwise, if not unfair, to leave the room without hearing a little bit about the stories on the ground from the various regions and business models that this panel talks about uh, in terms of how that might play out. It's a very uh, important and urgent issue. And then we'll talk about what might speed things up, what might unleash new markets, new opportunities, and accelerate things. And the fourth thing, if we have time, we'll try and take uh, some questions from the floor. So I'm, going to, I'm actually going to, well, I'll, I'll stay up here for the moment. So let's talk about markets that are hot places that are not, and so on. And I'm afraid I'm going to start with you, Paddy, because you have um, very unwisely won the, or what's already going to be one of the deals of the year. I don't know if it was last year or this year, but it's this certainly year. one of the uh, bellwether uh, deals, which is the Deva, Dewa 100-megawatt uh, project. So presumably you're going to say Dubai and photovoltaics is, is hot. So can you just tell us a little bit about that deal and then other areas that you... Uh, think that uh, that you're looking at or that you see as very promising this year. Thank you, Michael. Not sure why you said unwisely one, because I think we are absolutely delighted be because it is a very achievable tariff. What we have done, uh, it's, it's a 200 megawatt photovoltaic plant, 25 year contract, uh, 25 year offtake contract, guaranteed offtake by Diwa, a very credit worthy offtaker. Uh, we managed to deliver a levelized electricity cost of 5.845 cents per kilowatt hour. Just as a point of reference, uh, first year tariff is 5.1 cents. So it's levelized, so it'll continue to grow uh, for the operating cost. Um, so, uh, okay, the reason why, of course, it's sort of attracted so much of attention is that uh, compared to the sort of lowest known tariffs so to date, if you take subsidy elements out of it and all the rest of it. This is completely unsubsidized, it's very commercial. Um, it's kind of like maybe 20% lower than what has been achieved so far. Uh, but more importantly, that's of no relevance uh, in my view. What is more important is that 
we, in this part, we, are, we are demonstrating that in this part of the world where there is plenty of land, there is good uh, solar resource, and where there is good credit capacity, we are now able to compete head on head, uh, like for like, with fossil fuel for that segment of energy that we are dispatching during the day when the sun is available. So that's, I think, is the big deal. And it's not a one-off thing. And I think this now becomes a new benchmark. And we ourselves will continue to challenge this as we go forward on the next transaction. One of the other important transactions that actually hasn't been publicized yet, but it will come out just now, is a transaction that we won in South Africa uh, in December, 16th of December, I think, is to me an equally exciting or possibly even more exciting um, uh, opportunity. Concentrated solar power, fully dispatchable power uh, that is going to operate day and night because we will have full storage, uh, motion salt storage, so that we can in fact follow the load curve. So when the dispatcher says, you know what, reduce uh, the capacity, I'm able to drop it, pick it up. Um, 12.4 US cents per kilowatt hour is the first year tariff. Compared to where CSP was just three years ago, 30 euro cents, 12.4 cents, to be fair, that's the first year tariff. Level I says something like 15 cents. But that's a firm price for 25 years. There's no fuel cost, so everything stays the same. So all of a sudden, extremely, extremely, uh, we're starting to move extremely competitive. Quickly, what's hot, what's not, uh, not going to deal with what's not. But so for us, we really do see MENA as a market to watch uh, and participate in as we go forward. Um, southern part of Africa clearly is showing leadership. Um, and kind of a little bit further afield, I, we ourselves are looking very seriously at Indonesia. Um, and we're not <coughs> looking at Ind India, but India clearly is uh, another market to watch. Um, and I think the next thing to watch is to look at the opportunity to integrate photovoltaic with CSP. If you put that into one plant, then you really are starting to then look at challenging head-on baseload, uh, fossil fuel-based power. Okay. Um, Sammy, you've heard um, you know, Paddy, not surprisingly, thinks MENA is hot, amongst other things, um, and, and also PV. Now, I suspect you're not going to disagree with that, um, but how are you going to compete with him? 5.8 cents. We, we don't view we don't. Patty as a, a competitor. Uh, okay. in, in many ways, Patty is an enabler of the market across the MENA region. Uh, over the past several years, we've seen a continued decline in the cost of solar. When we started the company in 2007, it was very challenging to compete with conventional sources of energy based on our cost base. Uh, today, with the recent DIWA pricing and even pricing before that, we are seeing that we are able to go head to head with traditional hydrocarbons uh, at a more competitive price. Uh, and of course, the stability of our pricing every day, the sun is gonna come up at the same cost uh, is, is something which is proving truly valuable in very volatile, volatile times for hydrocarbon pricing, which is another discussion we'll be having. I think that's point two or three uh, in, in your discussion. But we do feel that the MENA is very much a hot market in the sense that one, we have continued energy demand growth across the region. Uh, two, we are really seeing uh, that the appropriate regulations are coming into place and that pilot, uh, projects are going from pilot to real programs in many parts of the region. For example, Egypt and Jordan, uh, Dubai is really introducing their program right now. Within Abu Dhabi, uh, the first utility scale plant was actually installed here in Abu Dhabi. So the technology is very much proven. It's very much being deployed. And now it's a matter of just getting it on uh, as quickly as possible uh, in multiple parts of the region. Okay, very good. Um, can you give a, a, perhaps an example of, 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 a, of a, you know, what, what, what's keeping you busy? What are you working on? What have you just closed? What have you just completed? <clears throat> give, us a, give us something, some concrete uh, example. Sure, we're, I mean, we, we, we've built projects now in eight countries across the region. Uh, we're busy in Egypt, we're busy in Jordan, we're busy in the UAE. Uh, and, you know, we expect lots of activity in, in multiple other countries across the region. It used to be that we'd be working at one project at a time in a single country as they're approving their programs up. A lot of that was projects being installed for environmental purposes or as flagship projects. Now it's just pure 
economics that drives the solar industry, and we're very excited about that. Um, Anoop, I'd like to bring you in, because you, obviously, you're, you know, Mazda are based here, but you operate globally. You personally, literally operate globally, you know, spending more time in the air than anywhere else. Um, but how do you see this region compared to some of the other regions? You know, Mazda also is in uh, the London Offshore Array, for instance. So you have a choice where you operate. How does this region measure up? Um, you know, I think I'll, uh, I'll do the famous Bill Clinton by um, answering your question by not answering your question. And, um, and really talk about this as um, we fundamentally think that um, going forward when a negative to low yield environment, their hunt for yield is going to be something where people are going to migrate capital to. Um, whether that's in uh, yield codes or into asset management or into green bonds um, that you just heard, um, our view is that the U.S. markets are still going to grow in the 3% range. The Eurozone, Japan markets are going to grow in the 1% range. China and India are the big question marks in that. When you migrate to a yield uh, uh, business, asset management makes a ton of sense for us. So for us, what we are looking at in terms of deployment of capital is um, uh, hunting for yield. The second thing is from, a, um, from an earnings perspective, as an investor, we either like to buy growth companies or companies that are really cheap. And um, our view is that uh, in an environment where you have uh, things based on a PE multiple, when the, when the E goes down, um, it, the P is going to have to go down. So we actually see this as a great opportunity to be buying companies um, uh, in these markets where we're seeing continued growth and good yields uh, that are out there. Um, the, third, the third thing I would just quickly say is that um, we're very interested in what's happening in China. And, and I think that you can't ignore um, uh, some of the proclamations that are made by the government, the goal that they have to triple their capacity over the next um, five years, uh, we think will drive a lot of uh, investments and growth, which is an area that we will focus on. Okay, so interesting because your answer, you sort of did, you did answer the geographical <laughs> question, but you, you also threw in um, the question of yield. Um, just if I can come back at you, is that an indirect way of saying you can't get the yields with these very low um, price points that are being set by some of the, 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 the projects we've been talking about? You know, Patty definitely has set a certain bar for us uh, uh, to, um, to, to leap over. Look, it, like, I think that the challenge for, for any of us are that um, the good projects start getting the lowest yield because it becomes ultra competitive. So you start taking on externalities of offtake risk or bond risk or um, what is your own cost of capital risk. And I think that um, it's unclear to me at this point that you actually get paid for that additional risk. Okay. Um, Edgar, whether it's a geographical or a, or a product uh, angle lens that you want to, to look at this through, um, where are you seeing in your activities the best opportunities? Yeah, so uh, we are based in Singapore and we focus on developing wind and solar in Southeast Asia and, uh, and South Asia, um, which is a very different market from Europe or the US. Uh, we see a lot of growth opportunities in wind in, in Thailand, in Vietnam. Um, Indonesia, we are actively uh, pursuing the first wind, large-scale wind development in Indonesia. Uh, we're looking at uh, Pakistan, has quite a number of wind developments. We're looking at uh, Kazakhstan. Um, so on the wind side, and you see it also from the equipment suppliers as well as the investors. People are moving away from traditional markets like Europe and the US. And I think South Asia or South Asia is a, uh, is a very interesting market where you still get good feed-in tariffs. Of course, a bit more risk on the sovereign side. Um, to answer your question on markets that are dead or not, I think Australia is not anymore. Um, so you see a lot of people moving towards Asia. Um, on the solar side, where we're also active, we see, of course, there's a lot of uh, solar potential in places like Indonesia. Uh, we are focusing very much on India, which is uh, soon announcing their next tender on the national solar mission. Um, tariffs will be very low, but I think it's it's very interesting concept. Uh, if you hear Modi talking about 100 gigawatts of solar in India, even he pulls off maybe 10 or 20%, I think is one of the biggest markets to, uh, to come. So we focus on, on, on Asia, anything from Kazakhstan to, uh, to Vietnam. I think there's a lot of potential. Uh, and any markets other than Australia that you would say, hmm, not so sure about? Um, that you've looked at deeply where you say, we just can't do that? Well, we saw a big uh, influx in, um, in Japan. And I think Japan is sort of slowing down. Uh, quite, a, quite a number of solar projects have been developed. I think the government is sort of... Uh, turning the tap a bit, uh, a bit more tight, so people are uh, sort of moving 
away from there. Okay, thank you. Um, Kerry, if I turn to you, um, areas, well, hot, hot or not, areas, models, uh, businesses, that, that where are you spending your time and seeing the most promise? Well, I thought the UAE was a hot market until uh, our friend here, Patty, decided to make it really hot. But uh, <laughs> Anoop says he looks for companies on the cheap. You may have one right down the road here. We, uh, we develop in 60 countries around the world. Uh, we so are 60, six, six, zero. six, zero. Okay. We have 25,000 megawatts we're developing. Uh, we recently announced uh, 3,000 megawatts in Nigeria in a joint venture between the Canadian government and the Nigerian government. We view Africa as a market of choice and a market which has a lot of traction with the U.S. administration, as well as a market that pretends to offer a lot of promise and you can actually realize it. I think that when people come into the market and set prices artificially low, whereby the returns are less than that you get from a UST bill, what in fact happens is you create a disinflationary market where people will be disincented to enter a market or you create a market whereby there are no margins to start with. So while I understand the competitiveness of the DIWA and the strategic nature of the DIWA bid, that is by no means being viewed by any as an opportunity to push down pricing. It's viewed more as an opportunity to demonstrate that solar developers should have an opportunity to make a profit. Uh, in the last 18 months, we've made several hundred million dollars in profit. We have no debt. And our strategy is to go to markets where we can earn a real rate of return and a real rate of return for us is approximately 800 basis points over the country's cost of issuing their own debt. We view markets like India as a choice market. Uh, it's inversely related to the US dollar insofar as the Indian market has suffered. Their interest rates have been higher than most other countries, especially developing countries, which we consider India to be today. Uh, the recent decrease in the interest rates there is inversely related to the price of the rupee, and we saw the rupee rise in the last couple of days and the interest rates fall. India holds great promise, but you have to have great fortitude and you have to have a great partner locally in India. So we will focus in India, we'll focus in Africa, and we view all other markets with caution, even though we are in them. But we concentrate our efforts in real growth markets where people will build to make a fair profit, utilities will pay, credit-worthy utilities will pay, and we focus on decreasing the cost of capital to ensure that we can deliver a fair rate of return for all of our investors, which is in accordance with the risk that they would be taking in a solar project. Can, can I ask you about the, um, uh, the projects in Africa, particularly in Nigeria? Is, are you working with Power Africa on those? No, Sky, Sky Power has, from its inception 12 years ago, had made a, a concrete decision not to work with any government or affiliated group that provides any form of subsidies. And the rationale behind that is if you can't build a business based on true economics, then you're always treading water because when those economics are there, as we saw in the wind business in the United States, the PTC credits, while they're there, the business is good. When they're not, it's not. So we go into a market where we can rationalize profits over an extended period of time, uh, not 20 years, but we look at 30, 40, 50 years, and we invest wisely. So you take, so do you take debt from any um, development agencies, development banks, or they're all subsidized so you avoid them? We, we, we listen to what they have to say. We think that there are some opportunities to work with some of the, the agencies. I think the challenge you face is you get into politics which not, don't necessarily have a place in, in energy. As we've seen, politics stifle growth in energy. There are some of the agencies, like the IFC and OPIC and XM, that do offer great programs and kickstart a nation or kickstart a program. But at the end of the day, it's the true cost of capital that we have to strive to achieve through forms of green bonds, like was covered in your previous session, or other forms of uh, exotic financing products that lead to strong, stable returns. In 2007, we talked about, and we all heard about, what was called the credit light deals, which brought about the crash of Lehman Brothers, who, who used to be the owner of Sky Power. Uh, we bought it back from them on pennies on the dollar and are grateful for that. Uh, what we're seeing now in places like Dubai is we're seeing PPA light deals. And that's not the way to build the market. That's not the way to build investor enthusiasm because with those type of light deals come failures and with failures come people who are concerned about making investments and the type of investment that this industry needs is strong, stable returns and not failures as we've seen with some of the Chinese panel manufacturers in Asia. 
I'd love to ask more questions, but I need to, I think, bring Paddy in because you, you've made some strong statements about uh, how one should and shouldn't build markets, which you might want to respond to. It's not a real rate of return, Paddy. Uh, look, I think there's a lot of speculation around uh, the Dubai tariff and how it got to that tariff. All I can say to everybody is to go back and sort of relook at their cost models. Uh, what I can tell you, it's not secret, uh, debt is around about just below 4% in that transaction, and uh, equity is in double digits. Okay. I not, have an army of economists, not, and even if your debt was 1%, you are losing 2% over a 20-year period. Yeah. I challenge you to show us otherwise, unless uh, your panels generate anyway, energy think, at night. I yeah, didn't want to get into a sort of complicated discussion here, but uh, I can assure you that uh, we are not in the charity business. And the proof, by the way, also is, let me point out, that particular tender gave the bidders the opportunity to also submit alternatives, and the client made it very clear that his ultimate aim is to build a 1,000 megawatt park. We submitted a 1,000 megawatt alternative. We submitted several alternatives, including one for the full 1,000 megawatts uh, at, at a lower tariff. So clearly, we were not going to be gambling hundreds of millions of dollars of equity. Uh, that transaction also has, again, it's not secret, only 14% of equity and 86% of debt. We were able to convince the bank of the creditworthiness of the off-taker and our own uh, track record in delivery in order to increase the amount of uh, debt, which is at a lower cost. So that also came into the tariff. Um, okay, now that we are in this, then I do have to explain this, well, what is obvious to us, but people may not think through it. The, the tariff number is built up of the same three components that everything is built up of. CapEx, OPEX, and cost of financing. In this type of a transaction, or in this type of photovoltaic, CapEx is about 50%. The cost of financing, equity and debt, the total is about 35%. And operation and maintenance is 15%. We were able to focus on all three components and bring everything down to the minimum. Dubai provides a fantastic construction capability. Dubai has got excellent industrial capacity. So the capex we were able to optimize because we were able to use a lot of very competitive local content. Everybody thinks photovoltaic panels, panels, pa uh, photovoltaic plant, panels, panels, panels. Well, you know what? Panels and inverters are just over 50% of the total cost. So of that 50%, only half of it is panels and inverters. Uh, we're working with first solar panels. That's also public news, so pu publicly available information. So we're working with very solid, reliable uh, technology. Uh, we were able to drive that cost down. We ourselves have got nearly 2,000 people who operate power plants in this part of the world. We have a very well-established supply chain to help us on the operation and maintenance. So we are able to optimize on that 15%. So every piece came together to deliver. We are very confident this is a repl replicatable tariff in this part of the world, um, pretty much in several of the countries, where the credit worthiness is the same. Do you know any okay. cadmium-based panels that have been producing energy for 20 years? Uh, that's one of the issues. Uh, that's technology. That's technology, and that's technology risk. So we price Okay. It. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to interview, because this is, this is a fascinating but slightly, slightly off-topic off -topic discussion. Topic, yeah. I think that probably everybody in the audience is absolutely riveted as well, <laughs> um, because this is what's known as a gauntlet that uh, Paddy has thrown down. I kept my on this side. This is a replicatable price. Um, Kerry either doesn't believe him or maybe is a sore loser. I don't know whether he bid on that project, <laughs> but I, it's a fascinating discussion. I'm, I'm a happy that. loser. A happy loser. Can I, can I, At that price, he's a happy loser. Now, what I, I want to do is I want to bring in Nancy, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Um, Nancy, your, uh, well, any I, comments on this, but then move us on yeah, to the next thing, okay? Sure, sure. Well, I would just say I wouldn't have a job if I didn't invest in subsidized markets, and uh, we've done pretty well at it, and certainly in okay. energy, the, the, subsidies, the subsidies for renewables are dwarfed by the subsidies for, for fossil and traditional nuclear sources, so I don't... Um, you don't make any, the market doesn't care about that as much as they care about their, it's the reward is the growth premium. And that's why you're seeing these multi-billion dollar companies out there succeed in these regulated markets. So you don't want to play, if you, you, you can't play successfully in this market, I believe, without understanding how to manipulate and 
and uh, navigate around that. And you know, we, we've got companies like Solar City and, and Tesla and uh, SunPower, you know, that we've invested in that, that are you know, poster children for... Now, so for if, you, if you could talk about some of those companies which have actually moved from their core markets into Africa and other places, because that's a very yeah, interesting ab trend. Absolutely. You're, you're, and and I, I just want to tell people that something that was definitely in the not category, hardware investments, is in the hot category because of the, the strength of regions like this, Chile, India. Um, you're just seeing amazing... Like, uh, one of our companies is a tracker company. It's and I have a pretty high bar in terms of growth rates in our portfolio, it's one of our fastest growing companies because it improves the profitability of a lot of solar farms out there, PV farms, uh, in regions that uh, like this one. And so um, it's been around for less, this is a company called Next Tracker. it's been around just about a year and it's already far beyond where, say, a solar city or uh, power light was in, in, at analogous times, and they're, they're just Jason. So I think that hardware is hot now because of the, the growth of regions like this that need to get every penny out of that, that um, investment. And then the financing models are driving a completely different uh, growth uh, trajectory in Africa and Asia, um, just as the lease did for uh, the U.S. market, you're seeing prepaid solar take off on the distributed uh, level in places like Tanzania, the, the winner of the Zayed Prize uh, is an example of this, off-grid energy is, is another one, just uh, uh, booming in terms of taking advantage of very low-cost solar uh, plus storage to create lighting, but then to open the floodgates for other uh, electricity uses in off-grid places in Africa. So I think that there are two very dominant trends. One is to the large scale, even solar thermal in China is, is coming with storage, is, is a really good market in North Africa and such. The large scale, but, but with better hardware, and, and you're even seeing um, panel investments that are going to increase the conversion efficiencies, something we never thought we'd do a few years ago. That's hot again. And then the, the viral growth. I was a tech investor before doing uh, renewables, and the, what's happening in Africa is so uh, reminiscent of, of cell phone growth and the ability to uh, really solve a problem at a very low price uh, for a population that hasn't had access in the, in the case of uh, telecom to communication, but now it's uh, to something even more fundam fundamental, which is electricity. Okay, so um, thank you. We, th this is this is great because you know this is other markets to watch. We're actually over halfway through, uh, but we have already talked about um, the MENA region. We've talked about Indonesia, India, or at least we've mentioned Indonesia, India, Africa, Nigeria, different uh, parts of the value chain, whether it's trackers, we've talked about large scale, we've talked about distributed. I mean, if anything, we've got too many opportunities uh, here uh, been, been placed in, fr in front of you. And there's only one person who is the director of knowledge at IRENA, Henning. When you listen to this, or from the work that you've done prior to this, can you help us sort through and prioritize amongst those or give us a different perspective? You won't hear a different perspective from me. I certainly would underline that there's a huge opportunity out there. Uh, from our work at IRENA and one of the knowledge products we have is the Global Atlas where we've just launched the second edition. We are mapping the potential for renewables worldwide and there are uh, huge opportunities out there. There's a huge potential out there in all regions. Uh, and I think many have been highlighted. Let's, let's look at Africa. Um, the global atlas tells you that you have 300,000 uh, gigawatts uh, potential in solar PV for Africa. Uh, a huge uh, potential uh, for onshore wind in Africa. Only a fraction of these uh, are uh, actually exploited at this stage. Uh, I believe uh, we can show that, uh, and we have shown through our work on uh, REMAP uh, 2030, that uh, also in, in those markets which have already advanced, uh, there is still a potential to double the share of renewables uh, in the next uh, 25 years. Um, so the markets are out there, uh, the potential is there, and 
if you look at uh, some of the emerging economies, you are looking at um, growth rates uh, in energy demand, uh, tripling of energy demand expected in Africa, which again uh, even uh, also shows that this side of the market will be there. Uh, the developments that, that Patty has been talking about, I mean, the cost reductions uh, are uh, putting this into uh, such a new uh, framework and into such a new context that I think uh, we have to talk about opportunities and perhaps also to identify what are the barriers that are stopping those opportunities let, let, from being right, let, let, me, let me ask you, uh, on those lines, let me ask you to comment on what was essentially that discussion there, which is the attractive markets are markets where electricity prices are high enough or the attractive markets are markets where, there, where policy support is attractive enough. Which is, where does your heart lie? Um, you need uh, appropriate pricing structures and uh, I mean otherwise you don't have a functioning market so I mean it, it's quite obvious but given that uh, solar PV prices have dropped so significantly now um, that bar is not very high anymore. Uh, what's much more important in terms of the financing is uh, adequate regulatory frameworks uh, 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 some way of uh, addressing the risks uh, and sometimes those are perceived risks by investors which are just cautious about entering markets uh, they don't know. Uh, so I, I think those are the issues that are much more important. Okay. Let me bring in one other issue, one, one, one potentially uh, worrying issue and I'm going to actually turn to, to Sammy. Um, I, I promised we would talk a little bit about oil and gas prices. Um, and if you could see it through the lens perhaps of Saudi Arabia, which uh, two years ago there was this uh, stunning announcement of a $110 billion uh, solar project uh, driven by the fact that Saudi currently burning a lot of oil for electricity, the calculation was very obvious that it would make more sense to go solar. Is that still on track uh, or is the drop in the oil price now going to jeopardize Perhaps though that initiative, perhaps others. Give us, give us the latest. Sure. I think. Uh, well, first of all, if we, if we take a look at the drop in the oil price, that's something that just happened quite recently. Uh, over the past several months, we've seen a very steep decline in, in, in the price of oil. But if we look at it from a, a long-term perspective, uh, oil just a few years back was trading at over $130 a barrel. Before that, it was under $39 a barrel. So uh, we started the company in 2007, and we've seen oil bounce up and down over that period of time. But we've seen a steady decline in the cost of, of PV solar. Uh, so in reality, it once again shows the consistency of the feedstock, the fact that our feedstock is solar energy, you're buying it all for 25 years at once. And if you're gonna take it from Saudi Arabia's uh, eyes and you're, you're looking at the, the cost versus burning crude, uh, or burning oil. Uh, actually, Bloomberg had released an interesting report a few years back. 2011. Uh, 2011, which, which showed really the apples to apples cost comparison between uh, burning oil. At that point, I think you used a $65 a barrel benchmark. 85. $85 yeah. a barrel. And, and it was a fabulous and, return. And exactly. Yeah. It was a back then, with back, those solar costs, yes. It, exactly, with those solar costs. So today, we're probably producing it at less than a quarter of the cost oh. at that price. Okay. Of course. Could, things will change, but it is. It shows that the stability of, of solar pricing is something which really works in our favor for real deployment. Okay, so what you're saying is that we'll ride through this market phase. Um, Paddy, do you want to comment on that yeah, as well? Yeah, just a yeah. quick comment on it. I mean, we're a Saudi company. We're very deeply embedded in the Saudi uh, power sector. Um, for our, our view, uh, talking Saudi and also pretty much, I think, the MENA, uh, low oil prices for renewable energy is fantastic. It's very counterintuitive, it's true, but it is fantastic. Why? There's a lot more focus on efficiency now, on utilizing, uh, and there's a lot more focus on thinking long term. So these are people who are very used to the cyclic nature of the oil market. Now they are forced to think about efficiency. So this will drive them towards uh, fuel diversity, this will drive them towards 
uh, renewables. Okay, that's a very interesting and, and counter-intuitive perspective, um, which I'll have to think about. Think. Um, I want to um, move to Edgar, because in Asia, it's not so much oil. I mean, your projects are competing very much in the gas markets, and we've just seen the news, I don't know if you all spotted it uh, a couple of days ago, that um, LNG cargoes into Asia for the first time in over four years are being sold at $10 per million BTU. So uh, instead of 13, 14, 15, 18, gas 21. is now cheaper in Asia, at least for the moment. Are you finding that an issue? Are you concerned? Does it jeopardize your wind project or your solar projects? Well, for our typical wind project, we probably have a development cycle of three, four years. So, I mean, oil will go back to a certain level. And when it was 100, people say it will never go back to 50, and now people say it will never go back to 100. So let's see what's happened next year. But what we see in the Asian markets is that a lot of these markets are very short of power capacity. Governments in Asia, or at least in where we are active, are not interested in green, they're interested in capacity. Whether that capacity is solar, wind, or gas turbines, or coal-fired power plants, they don't care. And in some locations, solar or wind makes more sense. Um, so we are not scared of, of lower oil and gas prices. I think uh, we need a lot more capacity, and, and oil and gas will not be only able to do that. They need renewables to fill part of the gap. Okay, so Anoop, you're listening to this very thoughtfully there. So the, the, the low oil and gas price is not a problem, uh, and in fact it may even be a good thing. Are you listening to this the same way I am and thinking, I wonder if that will still be the story if oil and gas prices stay low for another year or two years? Yeah, and I, and I, think, you know, I think about it in two ways. One is that, um, and I, to be honest, I haven't really figured it out, but um, here's, here's how I'm trying to think about it. The first is that um, a drop in any commodity pricing fundamentally is like a big tax cut. Um, uh, it costs less to produce whatever revenue you're going to produce now. So what do you do with that tax cut? Do you save it? Do you invest it? Um, how do you think about that? Um, the other way I think about it is that if oil heads down further to something like a 20 versus 100 for the long term and we come up with a new normal of 40, which is where things are going to bounce around, how are economic decisions going to be different for a lot of our um, portfolio companies that we're looking at? And so, it, so I'm caught in between this massive earnings which we think will flow through this, the system on a consumer basis, the world economy, 70% of the world economy is all consumer driven. Um, uh, how does that work versus we think a new normal, um, uh, w w which will take place? Okay, and um, Kerry, do you want to come in on, um, on, on the, uh, the, the, the low oil and gas prices? That's presumably the market working and therefore it makes your business models more attractive? Or, uh, sure, I, I think that two points, one is the the low price of oil is, in my view, is, is manipulative forces at work. It's a, it's a brilliant stroke of genius, if you think about it. What way to stem a, comp a country like the United States from being a next net exporter of oil and gas, but to reduce the price below the cost of extraction and to create enough pain? In fact, since oil broke $60 a barrel, there's been over $100 billion of projects that have either been stalled, put on hold, or canceled. It's short term. There's a lot of oil around the world. In fact, Alberta has more bitumen in the ground, more oil than Saudi Arabia does. We believe that this, in fact, creates an empowerment because if you're a government that wants to lock in your power prices for your citizens because you have an obligation as a member of a, of a particular government, you have two choices today. One, you can continue the path that you're on and wait and follow the price of oil. If I'm India, I would go and purchase as much as I can, fill my reserves at $45, $50 a barrel. They're saving $60 billion just on the recent drop in prices. But that aside, the markets of interest for solar today are the markets where one third of the world's population do not have electricity. So it doesn't really make a difference if there's oil or gas. There's no pipes to bring the gas to the homes. So these are the markets to focus on because these are the markets that need electricity and it doesn't matter what price the oil or gas is, they're not getting it today. So for us, it just exasperates the need for people to make a decision of what they want to do and forces governments to recognize that we're in a volatile environment that they can't control. Right. And I, I would just yeah, add Nancy, to that, that yeah. 
that in those places where they're off grid and they're often using things like kerosene that have tremendous health, negative health impacts. And of course, you put a little solar panel with a little storage unit in a, in a, a modest home in Tanzania and, and you get rid of that kerosene, you're, you're not only reducing the health risk, you're, you're empowering that family to you know, study, be able to study more with lights and do their, the kids to do their homework. So it's, it's a path to the middle class and it's immensely powerful. And I think that's why some of these companies are so interesting that are changing the financial model towards a prepaid uh, pay-as-you-go because that will open up um, solar to a much broader economic um, audience and then that network of, of phone of people paying for solar with their phone it's going to be immensely valuable to either a telecom or just some major industrial so I think they're going to be valued far beyond the energy component the network will be a huge part of their their overall capitalization value okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got about five minutes left, and what I'm trying to do, by the way, is fold in, I've got some questions that have been coming through, and I'm trying to fold them into the discussion, although we've got one here that says, can we talk about uh, uh, fusion energy? The, the answer, no. Um, <laughs> the, 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 um, but I do want to, we have started to talk essentially about accelerators, right, uh, in terms of real returns on real capital, in terms of, you know, dramatic cost reductions and, and so on, uh, in terms of new business models that Nancy has just uh, talked about. Um, one of them, which is in the background to this, is uh, I'm going to ask about how important is subsidy, and I'm talking about fossil fuel subsidy reduction. Anybody want to take that? Well, it's huge. Uh, I mean... Globally, and, and we've seen that anytime you 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 do reduce it, it, it just levels the playing field, and so um, and, and this whole movement of of um, not burning all of the carbon resources that we have is driving huge investment patterns. So uh, even when it doesn't happen, but people talk about the the uh, carbon bubble, that that moves capital to renewable sources. So um, I think that. The, the oil subsidies is really at the, the core of this and is, is an issue that is, is not going to go away. And certainly uh, in the United States, there's an opportunity to, to have that conversation as we see um, more tax policy discussion in the next Congress. Henning, have you looked um, in your work with the Knowledge Center, have you looked at oil, gas, electricity subsidies and whether there is now an accelerating trend to remove them? Yeah. If you look at my title, it's Knowledge, Policy and Finance. So in that, in that context, I've, we've yes. looked at that. Uh, and yes, uh, I mean, our focus has been on electricity pricing. And I think that's also part of the answer to your previous questions on the impacts of uh, oil prices. Um, the electricity pricing structure is, of course, extremely important uh, for uh, whether you can get uh, renewables into the market or not. And their subsidies uh, can be very uh, detrimental to generating uh, the right demand for renewables. We are, we've been looking at a number of country studies in, in this region, in, in the MENA region, uh, at Egypt, Jordan, Tunisia, um, and most of these uh, are moving out of subsidies because uh, subsidies are uh, crippling the government's budget uh, and they are using renewables uh, actually as, a, as a, a way to compensate for the losses and to ensure that energy access stays at high levels and uh, that I think is, is the right direction to go and it, it's a huge potential to move out of subsidies in a way that uh, you have support uh, from the population and uh, you modernize your energy system. I want to stick with you just for uh, another 30 seconds because we are running down the clock, but are there any, as you have done that work, are there any markets that you are, that you think offer, you're sort of surprised there isn't more interest? Any countries that have really done the hard work of policy reform, subsidy reform, et cetera, and there just doesn't seem to be, you're not, you're not getting the visits from, uh, fr from, from your colleagues on the panel? Um, I actually believe it's surprising that uh, the developed economies are not 
picking up uh, renewables more forcefully. They are sort of slowing down uh, and uh, <laughs> there is a huge potential to go beyond um, the 10% renewables that they have entered and uh, they are not uh, interacting uh, sufficiently forcefully in, in putting the policies in place to make that happen because it's not a matter of uh, huge subsidies anymore. It's a matter of right. putting the frameworks in place. Uh, Edgar and Kerry or, or anybody working across a number of countries, any countries, I mean, you don't have to give away any, any trade secrets, but do you think uh, so one of the questions came in over Pakistan. Are there any countries that you think, well, you know, actually, yeah, we've got to spend more time um, because they do seem to have their act together, but we're, we're not seeing the projects coming through. Uh, Jordan, Jordan, Egypt, yeah. Kazakhstan. Um, and, and of course, existing markets will remain interesting. I mean, yeah. we've not even talked about storage. I'm talking I about mean, the next, the yeah. next other. The yeah, other no, of course we have right. uh, we have the Pacifics, we have Papua New Guinea, we have Fiji. People are building. IFC is funding projects there. Uh, smaller scale, but interesting. Kerry, do you want to add any countries to the list? Canada. Sorry, Canada. 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 <laughs> now, I, I think this is a fabulous place. I, I must say to, um, to to wrap up. Um, so we can finish on time. But because what we've actually done is we've, we've said that there are opportunities across the developing world geographies, across the renewable energy, clean energy value chain, across the different financing models, um, that there are, you know, nobody has expressed uh, the view that oil and gas price drop or anything else is a showstopper. And actually that the new frontier of investment might be mopping up some of the more marginal, the, the Fiji and uh, Papua New Guinea, these <laughs> don't sound like very large electricity markets today, um, maybe in the future. But, um, and then that the new frontier is actually that, um, that the developed world, the core markets, actually now have to uh, reassert their, or they have to, they have to now run to catch up with what are rather sort of um, dismissively called in the agenda, the other markets. And I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you very much.